welcome everybody to our Come Follow Me uh, podcast, uh, Shattering Triangles Come Follow Me podcast. Uh, today, we've got a special format. We're going to do a little bit less of a discussion and a little bit more of a presentation. Um, as we cover Jacob chapters one through four, we have um, we have Todd here who's going to talk about a, a number of the important uh, phrases or uh, concepts from Jacob chapter one through four and, and has prepared some slides on them. I don't know, Todd, you, you've had these for some time, if I remember right, just as you've thought through some of the, the um, how would you put it, some of the um, implications of what's written in Jacob 1 through 4. And um, so it makes sense for us to, we thought, to share with you some of that information. So I'm mostly going to be in the background, uh, so you could breathe a sigh of relief if you prefer that. Um, I bet this discussion. I bet this is more of a discussion than we're anticipating. We we can't well, help. We'll see. Help ourselves, Josh. You and I have been talking about this for too many years to to not talk about it. So yeah. we'll see how far well, we go. It'd be hard, we... hard for me to have an not have opinions. I guess that's true. So <laughs> let's um yeah let's jump in. Uh, however you want to start, Todd, and and talk about Jacob one through four. Uh, I usually like to kind of start with some background about like what's been going on, sort of who's Jacob and all that stuff. But I think let's. I don't know. Do you, I think I think we'll get into some of that in these in these slides. Actually, yeah, we'll yeah. get a little bit of background on him. Yeah. So um, let's jump in then. Yeah, we got a lot of a lot of ground to cover, but let's not not have conversation about it. You know, I mean, right. The the reason, like like you mentioned, these slides have been prepared a long time ago because, um, man, I don't want to like frame this negatively or right off the bat here, but you know this is from the perspective of the the, the wide and popular usage of the term "looking beyond the mark," um, and I know that it's sort of like, I think you and I are both uh, definitely on the same page when we we both um, cringe how at how often this is used as a club to beat over the head those that we feel have contrary gospel views than than our own and, it, and it's become sort of a meme uh in uh yeah in yeah. The, the debates over gospel topics you know um yeah looking looking beyond the mark tends to mean um you know you don't you don't agree with me or um i don't understand what it is that you're saying yeah um you've gone too extreme and you've 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 uh, ventured too far from the basics that make me feel uncomfortable, and I think that's often, often a psychological projection that uh, that uh, I don't feel comfortable with the suggestion that there might be more required out of this gospel than um, I am willing to um, invest into it. Which is probably a judgment that I'm leading off with. That's probably not very helpful. But I, you know, why not start where we kind of, why not start at the genesis of this presentation, which is let's, let's explore what it means. When Jacob really does say, "Don't look beyond the mark." So, should we should we just jump right. in? Yeah, I think we should. Uh, I was just going to mention you know, one thing to remember about looking beyond the mark is that there's a specific sort of uh, context to it, which is that he's talking about um, what the Jews were doing, if that makes sense. So, uh, anyway, let's let's let we you jump in and that. Uh, and. Uh, don't yeah. you worry. We will. We're going to get into that, my friend. So let us discuss. Okay. Now, <laughs> let's be let's be methodical about how we unpack this because there's actually kind of a lot of territory, and uh, and uh, you know why don't out of, out of the spirit of us of both in joining in this, why don't you want to give this a good read because this is the this is the starting point of this of this great question. What does it mean to look beyond the mark? So do you want to take yeah. this one? So. You bet. Jacob 4, 14. But behold, the Jews were a stiff-necked people, and they despised the words of plainness, and killed the prophets, and sought for things that they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. For God hath taken away his plainness from them, and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand, because they desired it. And because they desired it, God hath done it, that they may stumble." Hey, any thoughts on this? Uh, 
I have a weird thought and a memory, which is I now all of a sudden reading this, remember that this scripture figured prominently in my uh, farewell talk uh, when I was leaving for my mission in sometime in the 90s. And, uh, and I remember 95, it. 95 to be more precise. I was in the MTC at the time, but waiting for you to get yes. there, for me, you know? Yes, the year for a very long time and uh had overlapping stints in the mtc together but it's true i've got a nice picture of us together uh 1999 or five sorry 1995 uh i was giving this uh talk and um the title of my farewell talk was everything I really needed to know I learned in primary, which is kind of ironic now. I had never really understood that, how ironic that was until literally just right now, because I don't think a lot about what talk you gave at your farewell, you know, what has it been 30 years ago almost. So, uh, and, and, and my point was actually a point that's kind of interesting. Um, it was basically the the idea is um, the truths of the gospel are simple. If you can learn those and implement those, that's your that's your secret sauce. That's there is no secret ingredient other than that. I mean, we're all pretty familiar with that perspective. I think it's interesting because it was a perspective with which a lot of us grew up, and um, I guess at that point in my life, I was sort of leaning into that. Yeah, but well, primary the primary doctrines are useful insofar as they prepare you for strong meat. Otherwise, you, right. your long-term prospects are to be malnourished by milk. Um, and Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can't be drinking um, um, formula out of a bottle when, when, when you're trying to be... You know, that's not good nutrition for a 30-year-old. No. Um, Okay, so we're going to get into um, what it, what the words of plainness could mean uh, and what blindness could mean and ultimately unpack what it does mean to look beyond the mark. So should we, should we keep rolling here? Yeah, let's do it. Got to make my little triangle. Built this presentation nice. last uh, summer and this we're just getting around to uh, to getting it. And while this, you know, this dovetails nicely to kind of what we we're just talking about. Uh, I think it's a it's a common temperament, it's a common perception in the church um, to believe that we have enough and we have sufficient where where we are. Um, and this is this is a Book of Mormon warning to all those that are ease in Zion. And I always think it's curious, Josh, and we've probably talked about this in a former podcast, the usage of the word Zion in the context of Second Nephi twenty eight. It's almost kind of a a, ja a jab or or a chide. Because clearly mm. people that he is commenting on would not be in Zion. It's more of those who um who sort of propagate delu delusion is probably a strong word, but propagate the the the, the comfort comfortable idea that they think they are, are already a Zion people or possess those principles. And he's warning to them that that say, hey, all is well in our current state of covenant keeping. Of, of 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 those who think they're Zion, will be unto him that hearkeneth the precepts of men and deny the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Will be those that say, "We have received and we re and we need no more." And will be that say that we have received the word of God and we need no more of the word of God for we have enough. And this is sort of at the heartbeat, I think, of this general general usage of this term. Look beyond the mark. It's like, hey, we have all that we need and to and to reach out and to expand and to seek greater, greater um, intimacy with the Lord and knowledge of the salvific kind is looking beyond the mark. And I think it's like we said or suggested earlier that it is a result of the feeling that if someone suggests that there is more than they currently have, it is... Um, it sort of undermines this idea that we should be comfortable and at ease where we are and that they are comfortable and ease of where we are. So let's shatter this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, cheesy. That's stupid, but sorry. Okay. Super, super good graphics though. 
Okay, so like Atari 2600 quality. <laughs> Josh, you were saying earlier, like, let's get some context to Jacob. And and this is, we get introduced to him in Second Nephi. Um, you want to take this one? Yeah. And now I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words. For I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children. For he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. And my brother Jacob also has seen him as I have seen him. Wherefore, I will send their words forth unto my children to prove unto them that my words are true. Wherefore, by the words of three, God hath said, I will establish my word. Nevertheless, God sendeth more witnesses, and he proveth all his words. So what's the first thing that we learn about Jacob? <clears throat> That he's seen the Redeemer. Yeah. So the first thing we learn is that his encounters um, with Christ were early in his life. Um, one could one could argue just from this that it would have been the context through which we should we should perceive or understand Jacob's full ministry is that he he knew his Redeemer in his youth. Um mm. And that's what we get here from Lehi. Nevertheless, Jacob, my firstborn in the wilderness, thou knowest the greatness of God, and he shall consecrate thine affliction for thy gain. And thou hast beheld in thy youth his glory. Wherefore thou art blessed, even as they unto whom he shall minister in the flesh. For the spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the way is prepared from the fall of man, and salvation is free. Um, so Jacob is an extraordinary individual, an extraordinary witness. He's born in the wilderness. Um, one may one may um, assume that because of that, he's being taught outside of the structure of Jerusalem. He's being tutored by Lehi and Nephi. He's being brought up in the order of their understanding um, outside of the confines of the um the iniquity of Jerusalem and the false traditions that he would have inherited had he been born and raised in that environment, but also at the same time afflicted both by living in the wilderness and by his brothers uh, who served sort of this left-hand affliction of Laman and Lemuel to him. And we we know that he was born in the heart of that conflict, and yet with the pure and direct tutoring of Lehi and Nephi, which suggests that our spiritual progressions in our youth can be much faster and advanced by virtue of of the um the administration of the fathers who are ministering to us thoughts on that <clears throat> um not not too much no so when we get into jacob jacob's ministry so we, we're launching here into jacob one jacob does something i think that is extraordinary not only in 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 just the, the doctrinal aspect of what he's going to start immediately introducing into the Book of Mormon, but also the connection that it gives to Joseph Smith's ministry and what Joseph reveals in particularly the 84th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. So this becomes one of the most elegant witnesses and, and crossover references of both Joseph Smith and Jacob, which I, I think needs to be emphasized. It's not, it's rarely brought up, and I think it's underappreciated what we have in Jacob. And we're going to get right into that. So Jacob 1, um, do you want to take this one? Yeah. And we also had many revelations in the spirit of much prophecy, wherefore we knew of Christ and his kingdom, which should come. Wherefore we labored diligently among our people that we might persuade them to come unto Christ and to partake of the goodness of God, that they might enter into his rest lest by any means he should swear in his wrath that they should not enter in, as of the provocation in the days of temptation while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. Okay, so what are the two big keys here that we get immediately? There's, I, I'm seeing two big keys. Yeah. Should, <laughs> probably more than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think sort of the, the, the more interesting, there's a couple things. One of them is they have many revelations in the spirit of much prophecy. I don't know if there's two keys, but I would, but... Um, so they knew of Christ and of his kingdom. And so the purpose, but the, and then the second bit is that the, the purpose of their labor is to persuade everyone to come unto Christ. And this underlying portion here is a reference to, and it's actually really cool because it's such a tightly coupled reference to Doctrine and Covenants uh, section 84, which, which won't come around, by the way, 
for another, I think it's what, 1832. Mm, yep. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's September 22nd and 23rd, uh, or 21st and 22nd of, of 1832. Um, so really, the Book of Mormon's been published for two and a half years, give or take, before this this comes in. And this is a great explanation of what it means to enter into the rest of God and uh, this is this is what Moses actually refers to sort of obliquely in a few different places as the provocation in the wilderness. Yeah, so Jacob's actually citing the provocation. And this is at, you know, sort of sort of the core of how Joseph Smith begins to, like you're, you're saying, rolling out priesthood doc theology, priesthood doctrine. Yeah, but, can we talk real quick? I think this is worth bringing up about how... Um, this, this idea of the provocation is actually quite clear in the Old Testament if you know what you're looking for. But if you don't know what you're looking for, it's not clear at all. Um, it's, a, it's an idea that, um, is that Moses was going to introduce these people into the presence of God, that they might behold the face of God, as you see in verse 23 there. Um, the Deuteronomists who sort of edit the old testament that we have don't like the idea that anybody can see god and so there's sort of there's some squishiness around it but it's actually still there um but it's not something that was i i don't it's not my impression that it was floating around in the culture or the religion uh of the 19th century based on the things that i've, I've read i spent a lot of time studying sort of the the theology out of which joseph smith's um perspective grows and then this idea of the provocation in the wilderness and um, Moses seeking diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God is definitely in the Old Testament but not a point of emphasis of theologians coming into uh, Joseph's time uh, wasn't a point of emphasis of the Reformation uh, and and is really in in some ways a an original observation or an original revelation to Joseph Smith. Uh, it, it seems to be that he's the one who sort of makes this explanation clear enough to understand it. Yeah, I mean, the sophistication of Joseph's doctrine on the priesthood is not one of, of, of an advanced theology. It, to your point, it's revelatory. Yeah. And and that's why the fact that, like, if 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 it's some sort of, Counter, counterfeiter or writer of the Book of Mormon, someone that's trying to win over people <laughs> with some sort of counterfeit scripture for their for for a religious movement for whatever purposes. Like so many people contend that the Book of Mormon is fabric a fabrication or an outgrowth of the mind of Joseph or a fabrication of of one of his associates or what whatever. The idea that you are that he is writing and a a, a a priesthood doctrine of this level and this type of that's this tightly weaved into the Old Testament and then into forthcoming revelations that it's just it's just an unbelievable witness to the truth of the Book of Mormon and to the revelation of the priesthood that Joseph was beginning to to lay out. And I couldn't agree more. It's just incredible. And to, and to show here in Dean's 84 that the, the key that 84 really unlocks is that he defines, he gives us a key of understanding that rest of the Lord is to be in the fullness of his glory and to behold the face of God. And that is a key of understanding. So when we go back to Jacob and he says, go into the rest of the Lord, he's talking about going into the presence of the Lord in mortality and and he references, like you said, the provocation, which is the Moses. And so Jacob is giving um, Jacob is giving the same type of invitation, the sort of spirited invitation to come into the presence of the Lord right out of the gate in Jacob 1. And this is an extraordinary thing. So when we we need to be very, very contextual when he says, don't look beyond the mark, particularly because probably in, in the criticisms that I encounter and you encounter, in 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 the LDS community, that particularly when we talk about second comforter blessings and temple blessings of coming through the veil and mortality, that 
one of the more common criticisms is, hey, you're looking beyond the mark when they're using that in context of a Jacob whose sole ministry is to invite to come into the presence of the Lord in mortality. So there, there's, a, there's a certain irony that we see in how this is being used, um, perhaps out of deep, deep con wrestling it out of context. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, I kept my little slides a little weird here, but rest of the Lord is the fullness of his glory and mortality. And <clears throat> so let's jump up to Jacob 4, 6. Wherefore, we search the prophets and we have many revelations and the spirit of prophecy. And having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope. And that's a different kind of hope, which would be a good conversation to have at a different time. And our faith becometh unshaken in so much that we truly can command in the name of Jesus and the very trees obey us or the mountains or the waves of the sea. One of the most beautiful, beautiful witnesses of, 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 of faith in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, the, the idea there uh that we've could you go back real quick uh -huh. briefly so uh we've obtained and having all these witnesses we obtain a hope and our faith become unshaken in so much that we can truly commit it reminds me of the statement that um mormon makes and i won't elaborate too much but he makes a statement in moroni 7 where he says and now i speak unto you unto, unto those of you who are the peaceable followers of christ and those of you who have obtained a hope sufficient that you can rest with him until you shall rest with him again in glory. Um, this idea that there is a, anyway, we, you know what? We, we better not. We're going to get a, it's very I tempting. Know. It's I know. very tempting to discourse on it, but we're not going to do it. Keep going. All right. Suffice it maybe to say that hope of this type of nature is a hope born of knowledge, not of wishful thinking. So yeah. well, that's sorry. a different type of hope. <clears throat> Okay, let's jump to Jacob 4, 8. Behold, great and marvelous are the works of the Lord. How unsearchable are the depths of the mysteries of him. I mean, again, looking beyond the mark, he is not in the traditional usage. Mm. And it is impossible that man should find out all his ways. And no man knoweth of his ways, save it be revealed unto him. Wherefore, brethren, despise not the revelations of God. Despise not the fact that the, the Lord will reveal himself, his mysteries to you. Um, through this revelatory process. So again, looking beyond the mark does not mean seeking out a knowledge of Jesus Christ by virtue of revelation. And we get this um, sort of um, underscored and underlined and punctuated here when he says, wherefore, beloved brother, be reconciled to him through the atonement of Jesus Christ, his only begotten son that ye may that ye may obtain a resurrection according to the power of the resurrection, which is in Christ, and be presented as the first fruits of Christ unto God, having faith and obtained a good hope of his glory in him before he manifests himself in the flesh. And now, beloved, might marvel not that I tell you these things, for why not speak of the atonement of Christ and attain to a perfect knowledge of him? as to attain to the knowledge of a resurrection and the world to come. Mm. So could it be yeah. clearer? No, I think this is a really lovely case you've laid out here. So <clears throat> let's keep going. Do you want to? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is Jacob 4. Uh, Behold, my brethren, he that prophesieth, let him prophesy to the understanding of men. For the Spirit speaketh the truth, and lieth not. Wherefore, it speaketh of things as they really are, and of things as they really will be. Therefore, wherefore, these things are manifested unto us plainly for the salvation of our souls. But behold, we are not witnesses alone in these things, for God also spake them unto the prophets of old. But behold, the Jews were a stiff-necked people, and they despised the words of plainness and killed the prophets, and sought for things that they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. For God hath taken away his plainness from them, and hath delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand, because they desired it. And because they desired it, God hath done it, that they may stumble. Hey, you know, it, a lot to unpack there, isn't there? Yeah, you know... Um, First thing that comes to my mind 
is this idea that God takes away his plainness from us because it's not what we want. Um, should we talk about that for just a minute? I mean, I think... We, I, yeah, I have a bunch of slides on plainness. So why don't we kind of unpack that and, and talk about that with, from, from these other slides that bring up the, the concept of plainness? How does that... You bet. Yeah, would that be better? Yeah. Do you want to jump into it now? No, um, we can table it. We can table it if that's we'll where we're right going. Now. No, we're, yeah, we're going to go right now. So despise the words of plainness. Um, so I'm suggesting this, and, and I'd be curious if you like this, if you like this formulation or not. Um, this is just a thought that I had. And so, you know, I, I kind of believe in, in I'm going to make a kind of a case for this, but plainness is is an understanding through the spirit of things that are mysterious or, or, or gospel truths. But the plainness comes by virtue of the spirit making those things plain to us. Mm. Love your thoughts on that. I guess I, I would have the same view, but I've said it a few times on this podcast in various ways, but I would say it again. My view of the idea of plainness is that um, it's always plainness. It's always given to you plainly. Mm -hmm. And then there's a there, there's a ways in which you resist it. Um, and you resist it because you have a reason, some kind of a reason that relates to your behavior or your desires that causes you to resist it. Um, and I've quoted this scripture, I don't know how many times on this podcast, but I'll quote it again. It's, it's in John 3. Uh, I want to say it's 18 and 19. And men uh, and the idea is and this is the condemnation that light has come to the world but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil so i agree i think that the the truths of the universe stream to us in plainness they stream to us clearly and 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 gently but not ambiguously but i think that the ambiguity and the difficulty in understanding them comes from the fact that we have other things that we're trying to hold on to at the same moment that are incompatible with the truths of plainness the words of plainness the mysteries of god revealed through the spirit so really the definition of plainness is when somebody says to you i don't know exactly how or why i know that thing but i know it to be true that's the very definition of simplicity and plainness yeah and um, you, then you have it's also it's contradiction which is something like if i can't understand it it has no value to me when the understanding of something requires a spiritual revelatory flow like the light coming to you that you put yourself into an active state of resistance to. So you reject the thing because it's not plain in your current state, even though that thing is a call to your current state to be open and to, to press forward so that that thing can become plain to you. Mm. That makes sense. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. Is that where you're going next? That's something yeah, we're going to probably um, well, talk a little more some, about. Yeah, there's just some interesting, there's some interesting examples of the use of plainness. So like in second Nephi 25 with, 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 um, with Nephi, he says, hearken, O my people, which are the house of Israel, and give ear to my words, because the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you. Nevertheless, they are plain unto all those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. But I give unto you a prophecy according to the spirit which is in me, wherefore I shall prophesy according to the plainness which hath been with me from the time that I came out from Jerusalem with my father. Behold, my soul delighteth in plainness unto my people, that they may learn. So, we get a different sort of usage of the of plainness just from this this verse. Yeah, you know it's interesting. It's interesting. I, I, in our last slide, when I was thinking we should talk more about plainness, I thought of this exact verse, and I thought, oh, we need to talk about plainness using that verse because I love this. They are plain. The words of Isaiah are plain unto all those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. The predicate is the spirit of prophecy, right? Um, yeah, reminds me of like in the intro of the Book of Mormon, it says it was written by revelation and prophecy. And, and I remember sitting in an institute, institute class, you know, five years ago when I was in college and uh, just kidding, it was like 
25 years. Ago. Um, and this, this, this revelatory experience was if the scriptures were written by the spirit of revelation and prophecy, they must also be read by the spirit of revelation and prophecy. And that was sort of a fulcrum, you know, there was like, it was like a turning point in my own, in my own spiritual um, education, which was something like, I have to obtain that spirit in order for these things to be um, opened up. So, yeah. You know, something could be plain and unfamiliar, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll table that for a minute. Okay, yeah, so, wherefore, yeah. now, after well, I... Make, wait, just, oh. I'm sorry, and I should have emphasized this on the last slide, but it was Isaiah that he's talking about. And Isaiah is obviously notoriously unplain if you don't have either the, the, the understanding of how the, the Jews wrote and the spirit of the Lord to make that to unpack that scripture. So anyway. Yeah. So second Nephi 32, four to five. I love this scripture so much. It's one of my favorites. Wherefore now, after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. For behold, again, I say unto you that if ye will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what ye should do. I do think there's a tendency to sort of reject something because it's unfamiliar. Um, sometimes I think this is why people feel that there's a challenge to the authority of the LDS church, uh, sort of in an ironic way by reading or thinking about um, what what the path of uh, the path of Sanct of sanctification, first justification, and then sanctification is that's laid out in the scriptures. People feel that that's a a threat because some of the depth of that understanding they haven't heard before, and they feel like that if it was true, they would have heard it before. Um, and I think that's a big part of why people yeah. resist it. Sorry, I couldn't hear you there. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Well, give me one second. I think I just... Is that okay? Can you hear me all right? Uh-huh. I just I had to switch out my power because it was about ready to go under. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so let's keep going here. Second Nephi 32, 6 through 7. Um, behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and there will be no more doctrine given unto you till he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh. So that's something we've probably talked about already. And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, and I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff neckedness of men, for they will not search knowledge nor understand great knowledge when it is given unto them in plainness, even as plain as words can be. Again, great knowledge, searching knowledge, attaining greater things that are a are conditioned upon not having a hard heart and a in a blindness of mind and a stiff neckedness, right? It's a it's knowledge that is procured through the spiritual conditioning of, of traversing the doctrine of Christ, of repenting and having a softened heart. And we've talked about this before, I think, like where a softened heart is is the mode through which mystery is endowed like we get in alma 12 um, and so to keep moving along this joseph smith says the book of revelation is one of the plainest books ever caused to be written which is just you know again another underscore on this idea that plainness is not mean easy and simple just to pick up and read, but plainness is something that becomes, according to your language, as the Spirit teaches you about it. All right. Enos 1. Go ahead and watch take this one. Behold it, just, it, behold, it came to pass that I, Enos, knowing my father, that he was a just man, for he taught me in his language and also in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and blessed be the name of my God for it. 
Isn't that interesting that um, uh, Enos was taught, sorry, click through there, um, that he taught him in his language and in the nurture and image of the Lord. And I, I think the reason why I kind of included this was, was that what, what happens next with Enos is this profound experience of covenanting with him and the Lord speaking to him and forgiving his sins and then giving him covenantal ability for posterity. Um, but that Jacob being Enos's father, this is, a, this is a really interesting connection because Jacob is the father he's talking about. And Jacob is the one that is teaching him in his language. You know, Jacob, who was born also in the wilderness. It's not like he was educated in Jerusalem, right? Anyways, I just think that's really interesting that Enos is referencing Jacob here when he when he sets that up. Mm, yeah. So here's something that's really interesting. I I do not I do not want to represent myself as a as a deep uh, Hebrew scholar, but this is a point that I'm um, talking to Rob K. A lot of our audience, a lot of listeners would will, will know Rob. K very well, um, scholar, both ancient and modern Hebrew. We talked about this idea of working be looking beyond the mark. And he says, well, look, Aleph and Tav are the beginning and the end of the Hebraic alphabet. And the thing about Hebrew, um, I think that we've talked about maybe, but is the Hebrew is a scriptural language in, in for many reasons. And one of them is, is that in the letters themselves, can represent levels and depths of meaning. So as you write a Hebrew scripture in Hebrew, you can take the words, there's numerology in them. There's embedded meaning in the, in the letters themselves and the characters themselves that can be unwrapped, unpacked and, and um, used to convey levels and depths of meaning from sort of this literal level to um, the mystical. And Rob K is really good at unpacking all of this reason why we're bringing this up is because Aleph is the first letter of the Hebraic of the Hebrew alphabet and Tav is the end or the final part of that alphabet. Well, Tav is the mark in the Hebrew alphabet. Tav means mark. And so Rob Kay's perspective of looking beyond the mark means that, you know, you in, in the path of spiritual progression, the Hebrew alphabet itself represents that path. You start in the beginning and you traverse through the alphabet to the end, okay? Which is the fullness of the entirety of the religious experience of coming into the presence of Jesus Christ. And so you begin mm. with Aleph and you go clear to the end, which is Tav. And so this idea of looking beyond the mark is looking beyond the fullness of Jesus Christ or the fullness of 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 god um which mm -hmm. is sort of kind of going beyond what is contained in the entirety of the path of creation going from aleph to top looking beyond the end um which 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 you know provokes a really interesting question of like what exactly does it mean to look beyond the fullness and i think we can maybe unpack that a little bit so yeah. the mark is the fullness of truth which is really interesting isn't it when it comes to hebrew are you related? Are, are you, you know, have you, how, how do you think this might relate to the idea of enduring to the end? Well, yeah, I mean, enduring to the tree of life. It's not enduring until you um, die. It's enduring until you are, you know, there's a number of ways of saying this, dispossess of all truth, or that you, you endure until you obtain a fullness of the manifestation of truth in both beingness and in progression. And you can come into and enjoy the words of eternal life and the fullness of the intimacy of that experience of God, the father, the mother, the son, and all of that, all of that, that, that entails. Yeah. I, I think of it sometimes as the end of faith, um, because you don't need faith of knowledge, yeah. which speaks to Jacob, you know, why not seek a perfect knowledge of Christ? That would be the mark. You know, the perfect knowledge is, is, is the full intimate experience, right? To know him in every dimension. Um, so <clears throat> we go back um, to this. 
the blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark. They must needs fail. So their blindness came from not looking up to the mark, but looking past the, the, the looking past the entire path of the doctrine of Christ, looking past and beyond it. And why would someone do that? What, what could that even possibly mean? And we get a little hint into this because it's an interesting question when it says, and they delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand because they desired it. So the Lord is giving them things that they can't understand out of the desire. So what, is, what does that mean? Like, what do you think it means that the Lord gives them something that's not plain by virtue of their desire? So why would you desire something that's not plain? Or that you that cannot be understood. Why would you desire something that cannot be understood? Maybe that's the right way to formulate this question, or a way to formulate this question. Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple things that we could go into that, but you know, based on the stuff that I've been talking about and sort of like you and I have been my sense is that part of the reason you ask for things you can't understand or want something you can't understand is because then you don't have to obey it. It gives you an excuse to not obey. Um, and maybe it gives you an excuse to wear out your life toiling around a question that you know ultimately can't be understood as a great diversion of scholarship. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice little, uh, it's something to do, right? And it gives you a, yeah, it's a little bit like, um, there's a scene in The Great Divorce, uh, the C.S. Lewis book. For those of you who haven't read it, uh, you should. Um, and basically the premise is that these, these individuals are coming up from hell, entering into heaven. But they the question will be whether they want to stay there or not. It's up to them. And in one and and he goes through various scenarios. And one of them is a fellow who was a professor. Um and his other buddy, who was also a professor, one of them has repented and one of them has not. So one of them is in heaven and the other's in hell. It makes more sense when you read the book. What I found interesting is I remember this, um, the, the, the fellow who's in heaven talking to the guy who's in hell saying, hey, the problem is that the way that you use your intellect, the way that you try to solve these problems that you claim to be theological and faith-based problems, these are not just professors of anything. These are actually professors of religion. Um, has nothing to do with the purpose for which your intellect was given you. Um, and and so endless intellectual inquiry becomes a nice substitute. Uh, searching becomes a substitute for finding. Um, yeah, searching can be fun. Yeah, like like always. Um, how does the scripture go? Um, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth i think is the one you're yeah thinking of. i think that captures yeah really precisely i think what the jacob warning is um and and it's interesting because he didn't live in jerusalem but i think it's a clear indictment of what he probably heard about the jews in 600 bc doing uh, the jewish scholars and which i think it was probably an indictment of the time that that can be extrapolated out and to um, to be a warning in every generation, which is something like, uh, if you busy body yourself intellectually about these concepts, but you don't go through and fulfill them, you are looking beyond the mark. You are you are transacting in the mysteries of religion without the intent to exercise faith to actually be a possessor of those things. Um, and it reminds me of the Joseph Smith quote that you're going to be obviously familiar with Joseph, Josh is our resident Joseph Smith expert in this podcast. You want to go ahead and, and uh, yeah. take this on? Yeah. Men will set up stakes and say, thus far will we go and no farther. Did Abraham, when called upon to offer his son, did the Savior? No. View him fulfilling all righteousness again on the banks of Jordan. Also on the mount, transfigured before Peter and John, there receiving the fullness of the priesthood or the law of God, setting up no stake, but coming right up to the mark in all things. Hear him after he returned from the mount did ever language of such magnitude fall from the lips of any man hearken to him all power is given unto me both in heaven and in and the earth 
offerings, sacrifices, and carnal commandments was added in consequence of transgression, and they that did them should live by them. View him, the Son of God, at saying it behooveth me to fulfill all righteousness, also in a garden, saying, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless thy will be done. What was the design of the Almighty in making man? It was to exalt him to be as God. The scripture says, Yet ye, uh, well, it says, ye are gods, and it cannot be broken, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, equal with him, possessing all power, etc. The mystery power and the glory of the priesthood is so great and glorious that the angels desire to understand it and cannot. Why? Because of the tradition of them and their father setting up stakes and not coming up to the mark in their probationary state. You know, this is this is a a this is the the theme of Joseph's life, uh, which is if you are going to err on the side of belief or disbelief, he would rather err on the side of belief. Uh, he says later in his very last public sermon, um, no man, no one was ever damned for believing too much, but rather they are damned for unbelief. It's, it's this idea that you don't set up stakes. You kind of just follow the Lord wherever he leads and you leave it to him to sort of sort it out if you've gone in the wrong direction. Um, it's very, very weird to us. We, because of our intellectual traditions, we think that the best thing to do is to set up stakes and not go past them. Or Joseph would have called them creeds. Um, there's another fantastic bit um, where Joseph is about to talk about Revelation and you talk about the book of Revelation, but he starts with an older fellow, um, his name escapes me, it'll, it'll come to me at some point, in Nauvoo, who has just been excommunicated because he has a view of what the book of Revelation means that is uh, opposite or different from that of his priesthood leaders. And Joseph actually says, uh, this feels too much like Methodism, which I think is kind of a funny, you know, uh, he could have used any religion, but that was one with which he was fairly familiar. Uh, I don't like that. It not Latter-day Saintism, he says. Uh, I don't like the idea of having a creed that I have to believe in or be cast out. It feels so good not to be trammeled. Um, what's interesting, though, is this is kind of a related concept, which is, you're in this case no one's trammeling you you're trammeling yourself you're saying no this is the 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 box within within which i will receive truth and if it isn't clearly in this box or if it isn't it isn't um what i think it ought to be or if it disrupts my life uh the way that i live i'm not doing it um and that's that's interesting that's a that's a yeah. It's a problem that I think is easy to have today because we have lives that are pretty good relatively. Yeah. And, and, you know, just to underscore that, I think it was really well put. Um, Joseph is using this very, this, this, this language speech of Mark as a stake. Um, they don't come up to the mark because the stake they put in the ground is not up to the mark. To go up, right. you know, and it, it's powerful because consistent with Joseph's ministry, um, he, the fullness of, of, of the God, the fullness of the invitation Joseph presents through the fullness of the gospel is to receive a fullness of that, of that, of the experience of with God and Jesus Christ, presumably also the mother in the mortal sphere, which is coming up to the covenant in every in every way not putting up a stake and say i'll come this far my theology my theological boundary is going to put a stake around this for perhaps protective purposes so that i'm not going to be exposed to the full demands of faith as i traverse to the top of the mount in the metaphor right. of the children of israel um, I, I do think it, it's important to note that it actually kind of doesn't matter why you've done that yeah, there's, there's a variety of, of, of reasons. And I and you know, I, I I point my I look at myself in this, obviously. This is not me shaming the universe. I read myself into this. 
or the stakes that I put up and say, hey, this is the boundary that I'm going to put around my faith and not move forward because moving forward requires me to, to look into the depths of my own soul, and my fears and my shadows, and, and to, to not call those shadows out to the light of God. And I'd rather find safety in my own sense of all as well, in my own Zion, right? Like, yeah. like this is not, this is not, there, there's a self-righteousness in, in, in declaring this against your brother in, in, in your ward, but boy, it's an indictment of myself as I read this. And, um, yeah, I think, I think um, if you, if it were to highlight one practice that would make more difference in the lives of people in the LDS church and, and just people in general, is if they would take, we would all take some time every day and figure out what, what stakes I have set up or to put it a different way that we've also used on this podcast, in what way am I resisting what God wants? Um, we sort of feel sometimes like our job is to wrest from God's unwilling grasp something that, some blessing that we really want and it's not it's actually to let him give us the things that he wants and stop yeah. resisting and get and the resist resistance. stakes yeah and you know that resistance comes to sort of to really kind of lean into like something that my wife lisa is very powerfully teaching and bringing forth is to the um the lens of what shadows am i keeping in the dark the shadows within me am i keeping in the dark and am i protecting because bringing those shadows into the light um, requires a, a level of faith pain that I may not want to encounter, but is ultimately required because the stakes I set up are protective stakes around those shadows. And, and what, what, what glorious things come from bringing them out, but I, I'm not sure there's a lot more pain in the experience and also confronting some of those things with, that are within us. Um, let's keep moving on Joseph Smith. You want to read this one as well? Yep. I say all those who are disposed to set up stakes for the Almighty, you will come up short. You will come short of the glory of God. To become a joint heir of the heirship of the Son, one must put away all his false traditions. Angels desire to look into it, but they have set up too many stakes. God cursed the children of Israel because they would not receive the last law from Moses. That's DNC 84 again. The sacrifice required of Abraham in the offering up of Isaac shows that if a man would attain to the keys of the kingdom of an endless life, he must sacrifice all things. When God offers a blessing or knowledge to a man and he refuses to receive it, he will be damned. The Israelites prayed that God would speak to Moses and not to them, in consequence of which he cursed them with a carnal law. Pretty self-explanatory, right? We could unpack this for a couple more hours, but should we keep going? Yep. Second Nephi 32.7 powerful and i nephi cannot see more the spirit stoppeth mine utterance and i'm left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff neckedness of men for they will not search knowledge nor understand great knowledge when it is given unto them in plainness even as plain as words can be i believe we already hit the scripture earlier so let's keep moving i, I think yeah. i liked it so much i put it twice in hmm. was i a, okay so let's get into into the consistency in the message of the Book of Mormon of the invitation into the mysteries of God, because it is ex the exploration of the mysteries, which I think the generation preceding us in, in the church was probably the one that I think that the heartbeat of this kind of the heartbeat, the, the view kind of was born in, in that generation that we were taught by that seeking the mysteries was, was the danger zone, right? Like, and and was was the great diversion to the simplicity of the gospel. But the consistency of the Book of Mormon message, as we've brought out many times in discussions and podcasts, is that the mystery, the mysteries is actually the path to the Lord and to the Father, it is the straight and narrow path, is the attaining of the mystery, which is the knowledge of God that comes by virtue of revelation. And that revelation is by virtue of, of faith and repentance. Um, that it's all inextricably tied. So you jump to King Benjamin, and here's Benjamin's. Benjamin's premise, my brethren, all ye that have assembled yourself together, you that can hear my words, which I shall speak unto you this day, for I have not commanded you to come up hither to trifle with the words which I shall speak, but that you should hearken unto me and open your ears that ye may hear and that your hearts that ye may understand in your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to your view. 
Let's jump to First Nephi 2.16. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, being exceedingly young, nevertheless being large in stature, and also having great desires to know of the mysteries of God, wherefore I did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me, and did soften my heart, that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. Wherefore, I did not rebel against him like unto my brothers. You know, Josh, this was one of the most impactful scriptures on my mission. We've talked about this quite a bit because it was a key that was given to me in a moment. I remember my first area sitting in that cold apartment in Kanazawa, Japan, <laughs> missing uh, missing you and my mom and my my friends and, <laughs> you know, my my brothers and that I would rely on. And. And wanting to know why I didn't have greater desires to go out and do things that were hard. And um, he says, I did cry unto the Lord, and he did visit me and did soften my heart that I did believe all the words which were spoken by my father. And I realized in that moment, the Spirit taught me that, that he can be the softener of your heart so that you can be open and receive more. And this scripture unfolded a principle that I, to me, that was so, it was such a turning point, which was, I cannot soften my own heart by taking thought. That he was the, he is, he is that prime mover of that softening. And I just had to, I had to orient myself towards him and ask him to do so. And so those early morning prayers became very, very instructive um, in that, you know, as I wanted to go home in those early days of that mission, you know, you and I had prepared so much for our missions. It was such a, it was such a, blast of cold water to feel like getting out there and wanting to go home even though you and I were so like missionary minded when we were in high school <laughs> like it was the thing we loved doing and and to feel the shock to my system but then to learn that I could that it was a result of a hardened heart and I could ask the Lord to soften me and he, and he did soften it was him that did the softening like and that was a very powerful thing to to learn an experience that initiated softened heart and some dimensions that help me. I think there's something here that's a little on the meta side, but actually really important. I remember asking uh, folks as a missionary, since we're talking about that, do you desire to believe? You know, have you even gotten to the point where you can plant a seed of desire in your heart? And, and then if you don't desire to believe, do you desire to desire to believe? And if you don't desire to desire to believe, can you desire to desire to desire to believe? Yeah. I used yeah. to ask myself in my mission, do I want, I want to want what I want. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I an think there's duplicity something. When you have a hardened heart, it's an inherent duplicity. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a. There's an internal conflict you have to solve, and that internal conflict is sort of what is the resistance. If you think about it as electrical current, you've got a resistor right in the way that's sort of like making it harder for the current to flow, and so you're not getting it going in the way that you ought to. Um, the other analogy I like to use uh, sometimes is, is stolen from Stephen, Stephen Covey. I don't even know if this all his understanding or explanation of how rudders work on giant ocean-going ships is even true. But it's a cool explanation. The idea is that these rudders on a giant ocean-going ship are, are actually so big that they can't be turned um, without a little trim tab, which is like a rudder on a rudder. Mm -hmm. And you turn that rudder, and then that gives you enough force to turn the big rudder in the direction that you want it to go. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is kind of what you're doing when you're when you're going to the Lord and saying, look, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. It's a it's the it's a, it's the perfect place to start. I love this scripture. Yeah. Unbelief in in inability to obtain greater light and knowledge, which is mystery, is a function of the hardness of your heart. But even receiving a softening of that hardness is a grace given by God Himself that can only be obtained as we orient and allow that grace to do the softening. So very, very powerful. To obtain yeah. that principle. And you have to start with an honesty that says, that says, look, I know I have a hard heart. I know that's why I'm not receiving. I know it's not your fault. I know it's mine. Please help me to be in the place where I can receive. Yeah. Um, which is which is again sort of this idea of 
I believe, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the two. Let's, uh, let's, let's not read all of this, but let's just invite the maybe the listener to go and, exp and to really delve into Alma 12. Let's just summarize that. How does that sound? Out of yeah, Alma 12, 9 through 11, really simple. If you obey the truth and accept the mysteries um, and keep them, uh, keep them sacred, then you will receive the greater portion of the word and until it's given to you to know the mysteries of God until you know them in full. But if you don't do that, if you harden your heart and say, I don't want to know more, then actually what happens is you wind up losing even the portion that you have and you get a lesser portion of the word until you wind up knowing nothing concerning the Lord's mysteries. And that is what is meant by the chains of hell. And holy cow, we could do probably two full episodes on that scripture by itself. Why don't we draw out for a minute what you and I talked about this week in that the, the retraction of light does not result in simply a space absent of life, light itself, but mm -hmm. leaves, leaves a cognitive structure that we could probably usefully call a lie. Yeah, yeah. I think one way to think of it is the sun, the light of the Lord is always shining on you, trying to reach you. It, in order for you to occlude that, to keep that away, there's an eclipse. Something has to be in the way to keep it from reaching you. And that thing is always a lie of some kind or other. It's a truth that you are not accepting, or it's an active falsehood that you're putting forth. But it is not nothing. It's something. There's something that you believe right now that is untrue that you need to get rid of. And that's always the case. Um, yeah. And, and, and to emphasize this perfect metaphor of the eclipse that you suggest, you know, the moon in, in size and magnitude is not the same size as the sun. No. But in proximity to you, the moon fills the space when it eclipses the sun and can block out the entirety of its light, like we're going to see in just two days. Right. And so something small and relatively almost completely insignificant to the light of the sun has the power to block its rays and light um, in that metaphor. So it, again, it's not the withdrawal of the sun in empty space that creates darkness. It's the distortion of what is blocking it that creates the darkness, which adds a component of, of, of unbelief from this from the perspective that unbelief is a false belief it's it's a falsehood not the absence of something yeah uh, black elk uh, terry warner used to always have this uh, at the beginning of his books black elk uh, the um, native american chief he's had or medicine man has had this sort of interesting saying it is in the darkness of their eyes that men get lost the problem isn't that it's dark out there the problem is that your eyes aren't working right you've got something in your eyes it's something and, blocking you yeah so you know one way to kind of think of the chains of hell is it's sort of like the collective links of false belief that we become bound by correct yes right and yes. which are not nothing they are actually active falsehoods yeah so, you know, coming to God isn't just the unveiling of the truth that's already fully possessed in you. It's being divest of the false beliefs that, that prohibit the fullness of Jesus Christ in the redemptive act of obtaining um, salvific light and truth that... Yeah births you back into your truth self as opposed to revealing that true self. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole, you know, we probably ought to do a whole podcast on sort of this idea of categories of various kinds of knowledge and ways in which you can know or not know things. Um, I really think it's interesting. Um, but I think um, you know, there probably is a category of things that, Well, I guess I'm saying I don't think there's a category of things that you are capable of receiving and understanding and knowing and yet don't know. I, I sort of feel like, at least if you're asking, I feel like the Lord will bring those things to you. 
Uh, And the thing that's keeping you from getting them is your unwillingness or inability, you know, the darkness of your eyes or whatever it is you have in the way of the sun that's trying to shine on you. Okay. Future, future episode of, of, uh, of of the the epistemology of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Yes. Um, Okay. So first Nephi 10. Um, Nephi was desirous also that I might see and hear and know the things which by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek him, as -hmm. well in times of old as in times that he should manifest himself to the children of men. For he that diligently seeketh shall find, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost, as well in these times as in times of old, as well in times of old as in times to come, wherefore the course of the Lord is one eternal round. This is the heartbeat of Joseph Smith's ministry also, right? Like, how do we obtain that um, degree of intimacy of God that the ancients obtained? And then, you know, Lectures of Faith is dedicated to that question of yeah. how to obtain that, that faith. It's basically, let's just take the promises seriously. And see what happens. That's yeah. Joseph Smith. Um, <clears throat> okay, First Nephi five fifteen, and it came to pass that I beheld. My, well, this is interesting, Todd. We've got First Nephi five fifteen seven through eleven at the title, and we've got two through four here. So I don't. Think yeah, I'm these, not sure which way I messed this up, but this uh, may not be. Yeah, but uh, at any rate, um, bear with my imperfections. Okay. They are the imperfections of man, but the things that I say are true. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and fifteen. First Nephi 15. This is First Nephi 15 because I, I, I mean, he truly spake many things. This is them. This is right after Nephi's description of everything. He comes back. He finds his brothers upset, and um, and then they don't they don't ask. Right? They did not look unto the Lord as they ought. Uh, I think it's 15:23 where he says, "How is it that you have not inquired of the Lord?" Well, it's not 15:23. I don't know which person it is. How is it that you've not inquired of the Lord? And they say, we have, or he asks them, if you have inquired of the Lord, and they say, we have not, for the Lord make it no such thing known unto us. And it's about as angry as Nephi gets. Um, why, did, what's the matter with you guys? Why don't you ask? Just ask, please ask. So. Yeah. And, you know, you and I have had a lot of discussions around sort of like what made Lemon and Lemuel wicked. And it was something like, you know, they made this argument that they kept the statutes and laws. They kept the law given to them in Jerusalem, the religious law. They they believed that they were of the righteous keepers of the law, of the covenant. And Nephi is suggesting to them that it's because of the hardness of your heart that you do not inquire of the Lord and obtain those things that he wants to give you. And that is the source of your wickedness. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, he calls it. He calls it great wickedness to not proceed and to receive. Here's your seven through. Uh, this is the one we were just talking about. How is it that you will perish because of the hardness of your hearts? Yeah. Have you inquired of the Lord? We have not. Yeah. Yeah. So perishing is is a serious thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions right now in the in the social media spheres of religious discourse around, around the LDS doctrines of, of the nature of hell and what is hell. And the Book of Mormon is really quite sophisticated as it's, especially Nephi and Jacob, as they lay out that the hardness of your heart will put you into a state of of losing the mystery and to not to perish in the dark and to not know Jesus Christ. And it is perhaps one of the great, great predicate warnings of the entire scriptural Book of Mormon scriptural record. Um, in fact, the bookend, you know, the, the, uh, what would you call this? The first verse would be something like the, um, what do you call it? The opening of a book or a, or a, a movie or a, a work of art, the, um, the overture, the, yeah, yeah, this is the overture, right? Like this is going to give you all the, this is going to give you all the notes and the, and the themes bound up in one, this, the first verse that you're going to get throughout the entire book, right? This is your, this is your overture and. Do you want to take this one? Yeah, I Nephi have been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father and having pause real quick. Notice the connection to Enos. Notice the connection that Enos says that of Jacob. I was taught in the learning of my father. It's it's a connector. It's very interesting. Anyways, keep going. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. And having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days. 
yea, having had a great knowledge of the mysteries of the goodness and the mysteries of God, that therefore I make a record of my proceedings in my days. Is this not an overture for the, the entire book? Yeah, it really is. Okay. The great Nephi, plain and precious truth. We, you and I memorized this on our missions. It's one of the more well-known verses of the scripture. It took me probably close to 30, uh, 25 years to, for the last phrase in this, to pop. Yeah. 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 Can I read this one, Todd? Please. Yeah. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the end. Or we could put in there, endure to the mark. Behold, mm -hmm. thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Um, you know, Joseph Smith has a a a bit in... Um, uh, 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 something he taught in 1839 it's recorded by Willard Richards that maps perfectly on to 2nd Nephi 31 and parts of 32 and he describes this as if you do all these things and have faith the Lord will soon say unto you son ye shall have eternal life um, this is a personal statement to each individual, very sacred experience, it happens to people right now today. It's a promise of eternal life. Uh, if we wanted to get into it, we could go to, um, it's 88, 1 through 5. Um, one way to think of this is as the Holy Spirit of promise. Um, but this is not describing a generalized statement, which is what I grew up thinking. Um, this is a statement to the person. You shall have eternal life, I promise. Like you said, it is the mark. Yeah. Let's not, like like you and I have been talking about this for decades. And in many ways, we've looked beyond the mark, Josh, because, it, you know, even though we're in a path of learning, sometimes it is easier. Like you've called it many times over the years, navel gazing. Mm -hmm. Um Sometimes it's easier to talk about it than to than to walk in the path of the shadow. Um, walk in the path of confronting the lie and the distortion and the portions of you that you that you keep out of the light. Um, and that's a hard thing, and it, but it's a beautiful thing to allow those parts of you to come into the light and to be to be integrated, so to speak, you know, hearkening to my wife here, and who with love and with, with precision of, of, of knowledge has taught me so much about inviting those things into the light and to not, to not run through life in the false, in the false, um, what do you, how would you say this? Not to stop running through life play acting to keep so to, as to keep those shadows in their place and to to live inauthentically in the light of god right like mm. and it is the great call to eternal life is which is to sort of take the depths within you that is rooted in jesus christ and the father and to allow to allow truth to prevail in every aspect of your being and to allow the father to uncover that and i feel that deeply and, and you know you know you know lisa very well and to be so appreciative of her to to draw that out in truth um, here we go to king benjamin who also offers the same invitation that um that nephi did therefore i would that you should be steadfast and immovable always abounding in good works you know the the, the good work is to is to to allow him to, as as Elder Busha said to be the doer of your deeds, uh, not to do good works to be seen of men, but to allow Christ to work through you. That Christ the Lord God omnipotent may seal you His. Um, easy to to read past that quickly, isn't it? That ye may yeah. be brought to heaven. 
that ye may have everlasting salvation and eternal life through the wisdom and power and justice and mercy of him who created all things in heaven and in earth, who is God above all. Amen. So our mark is God. You know, don't look beyond God. And, you know, when you when you put your mark beyond God, what you're doing really is making yourself the God. You know, you you can't escape the hierarchy of being and how you are going to locate that, right? So it, it, in, in the massive delusion that is epidemic in this world, we make ourselves gods here and put ourselves again above the great and living God, in so to speak, to look beyond him. But to look at him as the greatest call of our being to be sealed into him by virtue of allowing Christ to redeem every aspect of, of us. Yeah, I think uh, I think we get a little bit of truth in, in, a, in an area and then we think we have it all. And so we wind up accepting, uh, accepting a, a, a philosophy or a, a, an idea that is wholesale when what we ought to be doing is looking for the true pieces uh, yeah. and rejecting the false ones you're, you're uh, already... i do think sorry. <laughs> no uh, no no sorry i don't want to step on your point no i was actually going to go back to this good works thing i think if you read in moroni 7 you'll actually learn that you can't abound in good works unless christ is the doer of your works the works that you think are good if not done in Christ, are not good. Uh, yeah, that's a whole whole other question. So it is, I, I, yeah. And 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 as an indictment to all of us, not just to those maybe our our well intended, meaningful friends who don't believe in God. Um, it's not an indictment just to them; it's an indictment to everybody that you you are always worshiping God. You're always worshiping a God that you're establishing in this world. And what that God is, is, is what you, you, you tend to, and you pay attention to, and you hold up and you, and you put ultimate value in. And the question is, is will we be truthful about the God that we're establishing in this world? And can we, can we endure the truth that manifests the true and living God? And I don't know, we might be a little bit off here, but this, I feel compelled in my heart to, to speak to this, that. You, you always worship a God, um, but can we move into truth and allow all of those parts within us to also worship that true and living God and um, to be sealed into him? <laughs> um, DNC 76 is one of my favorite things to perhaps end with always because as we all know 76 is you know the middle part portion of 76 is the great the great vision of the kingdoms of, of heaven the kingdoms of glory that that um joseph and uh, oliver get right it's not sydney it's oliver right it's sydney oh it's sydney you're right you were right yeah it's at the johnson farm in kirtland but what is at least in my own <clears throat> anecdotal experience is that the that the beginning and the end is often overlooked and mm. sort of the vision of the three degrees is sort of like the parenthetical that they go into, but the, the real, not the real, just as important as the beginning and the end of 76. So if you mm. take out the parenthetical of the great, you know, the great vision of the degrees of glory, let us put that on the shelf for a moment so that we can pay attention to, and obtain the great promise that's also being revealed in DNC 76. So would you like to read the first portion, the first part of 76? We'll skip the parenthetical of the middle, and then we'll end with the conclusion of 76. How does that sound? That sounds great. For thus saith the Lord, I, the Lord, am merciful and gracious unto those who fear me, and delight to honor those who serve me in righteousness and in truth unto the end. Great shall be their reward, and eternal shall be their glory. And to them will I reveal all mysteries, yea, all the hidden mysteries of my kingdom from days of old and for ages to come. And will I make known unto them the good pleasure of my will concerning all things pertaining to my kingdom? Yea, even the wonders of eternity shall they know, and things to come will I show them, even the things of many generations. And their wisdom shall be great, and their understanding reach to heaven. And before them the wisdom of the wise shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent shall come to naught. 
for by my spirit will I enlighten them, and by my spirit will I make known unto them the secrets of my will. Yea, even those things which I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor yet entered into the heart of man. Would you like to comment on those incredible verses? <laughs> you know, um, I don't think uh, most of us have ever known anyone who lives like this. That's I think a great we, invitation, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think if we could just understand how, like so many things, um, how much the Lord is offering for us, and really the only thing we have to do is yield. There isn't a a, a special kind of a yielding requires obedience, sure, but it's it's not the kind of like soul crushing difficult how do i get myself to do this stuff when i don't want to thing that we all sort of yeah. experienced and so yeah it's amazing what you can learn if you'll yield to truth instead of instead of holding on to one or more lies it's all of the all of it is available to us joseph says even the least saint shall know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. There's no yeah. limit. There's no, there's no slow. There can, it can be slow. It's been slower for me than maybe at times I thought I wanted it to be, but that's because it had to be. That's because I had things that I was unwilling to let go of. And as I've let go of them, I've learned more. And I, I hope to continue that path. Yeah. Amen. And, and this invitation of 76 <laughs> is worth revisiting daily. Um, it, it should be in the forefront of our of our worship, and to 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 regularly be reminded of what is being offered to us by the Lord and how good He is. Yeah. So let us jump to the to let's skip over the parenthetical of the vision, and continue mm -hmm. on in the verses that Josh read in the end of seventy six, where he continues and says. But great and marvelous are the works of the Lord and the mysteries of his kingdom, which he showed unto us, which surpass all understanding in glory and in might and in dominion, which he commanded us we should not write while we were yet in the spirit and are not lawful for man to utter. Neither is man capable to make them known, for they are only to be seen and understood by the power of the Holy Spirit, which God bestows on those who love him and purify themselves before him. To whom he grants this privilege of seeing and knowing for themselves, that through the power and manifestation of the Spirit, while in the flesh, they may be able to bear his presence in the world of glory. So why don't we conclude with that invitation and witness of the founding prophet of this dispensation, Joseph? Yeah, let's do that. Um, thank you guys for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Todd, for all of the work that's gone into these slides and to this um, putting together this, um, I guess, maybe different than most people think of it, idea of what it means to look beyond the mark. And uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week. Thank you so much.